Hello and welcome to Symbols and Secrets, the podcast for practitioners of the mystery arts. Our goal is to help you create more powerful experiences for your audiences by having conversations with the world's best magicians, mentalists, and everyone in between. The show is hosted by a 20-year world-traveling mentalist, and here he is, Jonathan Pritchard. Thank you for that introduction, Malcolm. And yes, hello, I am Jonathan Pritchard, your host, and thank you to you for listening. In this episode, you get to meet one of my favorite creators and also people on the planet. He's a mentalist who has space for appreciating mystery, which seems like a weird thing to say, but you'll understand after giving this a listen. As always, if you'd like to get connected, support the show, head over to symbolsandsecrets.com slash secret, and you can get plugged in there. That's it. I want to get right into it. So now meet the guy who needs no introduction. Hi, I'm Alain New. I'm known as the man who knows. And for anybody who doesn't know, they are about to find out. So hello, man. Dude, it has been... Uh, way too long since I've seen your smiling face. What are you What are you into <laughs> nowadays? Uh, I'm back in Las Vegas. I've been spending the East Coast, uh, my East Coast time over the last couple of months, uh, both uh, getting all of my stuff. I have still a lot of stuff on the East in my in a storage unit and stuff. So I've been kind of going through that. Fortunately, I have a nice team of friends that have been very helpful to me. My, uh, my fiance still lives out there. And so we're trying to sell her condo, but, uh, but ultimately we are, uh, you know, we're moving stuff from the East coast out here to the West coast. And then I'm also, I also went on a little tour out there and then I go back there in, uh, in a couple of weeks to go back to, uh, uh, do, I think I'm the very first special guest of magic con, which is, uh, the uh, North Carolina, the new North Carolina convention put on by Dan Harlan and Sarah Elephant. That's right. They just did a lecture up here in Asheville over the weekend. That's and right. Asheville. I, I forgot that you're tuning in from Asheville. Yep. That's, that's where I'm hanging my hat between shows nowadays. And it was delightful to get to see them in person. And when they said about, hey, we're, we're doing a magic con, it was exactly on a date I had just gotten booked. So it's, it's just right smack dab in the middle. I, I would have loved to hang out. So I will wave in your general direction in spirit on the day of. Well, hopefully you have lots of North Carolinian, North Carolinians, is that what you call yourselves? Uh, yeah. Who, uh, who will come out and, uh visit me at MagicCon. I'm putting on, uh, uh, my own show. I'm lecturing as well with, uh, my, uh, my lecture called, uh, mentalism virtual and live. And so it basically has, uh, effects that you can do both virtual and live. And is that the PDF that I picked up a little while ago? Yes. Because the thinking in there, I, I love it. So I'm not even going to dig in at all. Smart people can find it, and I highly recommend anybody to be there for it. But the the work in there is just so cool. Like, okay, I said I wasn't going to dig in, but that, that um, how do I put it? The positive thought, no negative thought, and we all seem to come together at a mystical, magical revelation together. That that routine is just such solid work on what is often thought of as a tired old workhorse. Nobody's ever going to be fooled by that and turns it into a, a centerpiece of just elegant experience. I, I love it. Anyway. It's one of my favorite things to do is to take a simple idea that I think is... Uh will will generally amaze people no matter what and then and then if it's so simple that uh it's oftentimes overlooked i like to put on as much uh presentation around it as possible in order to really to really uh let that uh small idea shine in the most magnified way possible man there are a couple different directions i want to go with that from my martial arts background 
doing Wing Chun Kung Fu, oh, the okay. first the first form is kind of, it's kind of called the little idea, essential uh, details, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. then the rest of the system unfolds from there. So it's kind of the power of a small idea is what you're talking about. And also you're one of the few people who I, I take it as a good thing when somebody says, Oh, I can wring as much entertainment out of this as possible. I did 20 minutes on one, one bit. And usually you're like, oh, if that would have been better at three minutes, not 20 minutes. However, having seen you work, like it is incredible how much entertainment and experience you get out of a small idea. So I kind of wanted to drill into that of the time worn conversation of Magicians saying mentalists are just magicians doing different kind of tricks and mentalists saying that it's something completely different. What What's your vibe on what it is you're doing on stage for an audience? Okay, so the way I differentiate magic from mentalism from any other of what we'll call the mystery arts is first we'll, we'll take the broader perspective of the mystery arts. So you've got basically... First of all, let's say a giant, giant pie, which we'll call the arts and entertainment world. And then within that giant pie, you have a tiny little sliver, which would be called the mystery arts. And within the mystery arts, it's not just a bunch of magicians. It's like magicians, but then there's also mentalists. And then there are hypnotists, stage hypnotists. Uh, you've got uh, seance uh, mediums. You have ghost hunters. You've got uh, sideshow artists, fortune tellers. I mean, it really, and when you think about each one of those things, like even in the world of fortune telling, it breaks down into tarot readers, palm readers, and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, each one of those different disciplines within the mystery arts is actually a discipline unto itself in which you could spend like Wing Chun your entire life practicing that one thing and never having to leave that one thing and still not become a full master of that one thing. So, so what's interesting though, is that when you're in the mystery arts, you have a lot to choose from. And if you're creating a presentation, like a mentalism presentation, or even a magic show type of presentation, you might decide at some point to include some other aspect of the mystery arts into your work in order to, in order to give it a different flavor, right? So, I mean, so within the mystery arts, a lot of times it becomes the mixed mystery arts, the different, the, 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 uh, the sidebar to MMA, the mixed mystery arts is basically like different, uh, different types of, uh, different disciplines within the mystery arts that say a magician might add a little bit of fortune telling or a little bit of mentalism or a little bit of hypnosis mentalist might add a little bit of hypnosis or a little bit of fortune telling or a little bit of you know or or, or some or maybe they might decide to do a, a a seance one year and so there are different things that you can do and 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 depending on how much you devote yourself to each one of those disciplines will also determine how well you master that thing within the mystery arts within the thing that we're talking about um, so that being said, I feel like the difference between magic and mentalism is really that magic explores pretty much everything that might be impossible. So it's going to use, uh, elements of psychology and sleight of hand and manipulation and, and, uh, things like that in order to give people the most impossible experience that they can imagine. And what a mentalist does, I think which is different from a magician is they might demonstrate something that represents the potentially possible. So rather, so, so even though it's not necessarily 100% impossible or, or not necessarily 100% possible, it's something that the audience might conceive of as being very possibly potential. And so, so something like, can we move objects with our mind? Can we bend metal with our mind? Can we read people's minds? Can we predict the future? Can we heal people through the power of thought or uh, the, the, the power of energy? Um, all of those things are things that are, you know, controversial in the world of science. They would ca call all of that stuff pseudoscience, but, uh, but they are things that the average human being might feel they, 
they have some kind of inner uh, belief within themselves about, you know, they might think that maybe they can maybe, maybe through, and oftentimes this happens when there's no other answer. So, I mean, like, let's say a, a family member of yours suddenly falls into a coma and you're so close to this person that you just want them to come out of that coma. Well, you're going to do everything that you, there's nothing you can do. So, so the only thing you can do is pray or, or meditate or focus energy or, or, or post on Facebook for everybody to pray for this person. You know, I mean, I mean, anything that you can do because there's nothing you can do. So you do whatever you can do to make that thing work. And if it works, then, then great, you know, then this, this, and then, and, and you have a, you have a story to tell if it works, if it doesn't work, then, you know, the, that's, that's one of those things where, you know, when you, you sometimes, sometimes things are uncertain, but, uh, interestingly, I, I do believe that when, when things are the most uncertain, they are also, uh, it, it is also possible that anything can happen. Yeah. And that's one thing I've appreciated about just you, not even your work, just you is that you appreciate mystery that you've got space for unknowing because counterpoint, there are a lot of magicians who are on a crusade. And I'm using that word specifically. They're on a crusade to explain that there is no supernatural. There is no paranormal. There is no such thing at mad as magic. And now I'm going to do a 70 minute magic show. To me, that is bizarre. Like that is very, very strange. So your it is interesting. The, the, the concept of magicians relationship with the impossible. That is very interesting. But mainly because they, I think what it is, is that they feel that they can, since they can duplicate just about anything that is impossible, that anything that might appear impossible ought to be an illusion. Um, anything that, you know, and, and I think that, I think that now more than ever, because of the world of consciousness science, uh, people are starting to discover that there is actually, you know, a, a, and a, some some understanding of ESP in the form of conscious entanglement and some understanding of clairvoyance and even precognition using, you know, basically tuning into this, uh, ether that, uh, that for a long time they didn't think existed, but now I think more than ever, they scientists are starting to realize that there is something that binds us that is beyond what would ordinarily be seen as uh, tangible. Right. Because it, it's, it's so strange that there's this stronghold of all life are particles bouncing around and that gives rise to consciousness and experience. And nope, that's, that's it. That's the explanation and end of discussion when just being alive to experience how wacky life is, is at its heart mystery which it, it's so bizarre to me for folks going, no, no, there's nothing mysterious about it. I'm matter experiencing matter. And that that's perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so weird. You know, in my book, State of Mind, which, uh, which by the way, you can get on Amazon in the back of that 325 page, uh, book of, uh, all kinds of, you know, different experiences, but it, there are ways of being able to experience uh, consciousness that, uh, that I discuss in that book, including things like, you know, praying for a parking space and that sort of stuff, fun little things. But I talk a, a little bit more in depth and I usually have one or two stories that are actually really fun. Some of them even mentioned the, 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 particularly the parking space one actually talks about how I was trying to find a parking space on my way to visit, to see Max Maven's show being performed at the Abingdon Theater in New York City. And of course, New York is like an impossible place to park. And I just have, I have a crazy story about that whole thing in my book. But, but the other thing that I was going to say is that, uh, is that there's another thing that I, I call the telepathic voicemail. And that's also in the book in which I say that, uh, you know, when you haven't spoken to somebody in a long time, you can oftentimes send them like a telepathic voicemail by, by just meditating on bringing them into your life in, in some way. And so of course, 
during the pandemic, I had, well, during the pandemic, I started to just think about people who I haven't seen in a long time. And this one person I haven't seen since my early 20s was this uh, friend of mine named Cynthia, who back in my early 20s, you know, she was really kind of one of the first people that ever came into my life who I said to myself, wow, she is like pure magic. Just the way she is, is like pure, like I could feel like she could read my mind. I could feel like she always knew the answer to things. She, she had a way of being able to express herself that was very intuitive. And, um, and in many ways, she kind of helped to shape my own ideas of magic just from knowing her. And so I lost touch with her. And of course, there were lots of ups and downs in our lives. We we're both artists. So, I mean, we, we went through all kinds of crazy stuff, both of us, but, uh, and, and really on my side, that was what it was. And I knew that on her side, it was so indeed as well, but I lost touch with her. And during the pandemic, of course, when my mind kind of cycled back to her, I was thinking, wow, you know, it sure would be nice to know if she's, you know, even still alive, like whether or not she's even around. And, um, and so, uh, so, so I started thinking about her and, uh, and in some ways by doing so, if you're kind of sending out that telepathic voicemail and then the weirdest thing happened, like within, within a couple of weeks, suddenly I get this email from her and it was in response to a newsletter that I had sent out, you know, my own monthly newsletter. And she's like, is this my good friend, Alan? And, uh, and, and then, and then literally just this past weekend, I actually saw her for the first time in like 25 years. And so, um, so that was, uh, that was really nuts just being able to, you know, those kinds of things are things that I think that, you know, we can say it was a coincidence. We can say all of those things, but, uh, I love being able to, well, what I like most is that I wrote about them. <laughs> and then when, the, when I actually use these concepts in some weird way, they, I actually find them working. And so, uh, you know, in many ways, I'd say that magicians in particularly are interested in methods that are very, very, uh, instructional. So anybody who reads a magic book, it's like reading the worst Ikea instructions possible of how to do anything. And, uh, and, and, you know, in fact, because I've read so many magic books, I'm actually extraordinary at putting together Ikea furniture. Like I, I'm adding I can, that to my resume. What a, what a great takeaway from growing up reading magic recipe books. That is perfect. Well, I mean, that, that's not something that anybody can do. Like, like even smart people can read a magic book and they, they won't be able to get through it because, because they can't put their mind into something that is literally so step-by-step step that they can't really skip without missing something that's really important. And so it's like, uh, so, so you, as a person like, you know, like us and, and as many of our friends who read, you know, have libraries of magic books and stuff like that. That's like an art form to be able to read a magic book. In my opinion is the real initiation of being a magician, because if you, if you, if you can try to read a magic book and you can't get through it, then, then you're probably not a magician, <laughs> but if you can get through it, then poof, then boom, you, you've become you've become knowledgeable in the ways of magic, whether you can actually perform it or not is another question, but, but you can become knowledgeable in magic just by reading a magic book and knowing how to appreciate what you're reading while you read a magic book, but, uh, not everyone can do it. You know, real smart people can they'll glaze over after the first page. And then it's like, forget about it. You know, <laughs> whereas us, we'll just like, we, we can speed read through magic books. That's a great insight. And I like that word initiation because it goes way, way back to the beginning of mystery cults and that kind of a thing. So how did you find your way down that rabbit hole of Pythagoras and number theory as divination and that kind of a thing? What took you down that path? Well, I just like that kind of stuff. I think that, uh, I think that anything that can be shown to other people to make sense to them, that is, you know, like, so, so, I mean, if you, if you can describe things that are, you know, sacred geometry or whatever to somebody and have it, have it make sense to them, then, 
then it just kind of helps to, it helps them to understand the mystery of whatever, you know? So, I mean, it's funny because in, in Washington, DC, there's a pentagram in which, uh, which the streets actually form a pentagram in this, in the map of DC. And ironically, you know, the pentagram obviously is the upside down five star, five star, uh, five pointed star. So, so the actual, the actual head of the pentagram, which not too many people know, cause they might've heard that there's a pentagram in DC, but the head of the pentagram is the white house. And, <laughs> and that is, and that is, and it's really interesting just because it is a pentagram, but it's also not just a pentagram. It's an un, it's a broken pentagram, which means that there's one street that doesn't actually create the full, uh, that creates the full pentagram and all of that is actually, you know, considered to be very, very sacred, magical knowledge. When you go back into it, some people would call it demon worship or devil worship or something like that. But I would, I would just say it's like very, very deep magical knowledge of like basically bringing in spirits from out or allowing spirits from the outside enter into this sacred realm. And, uh, and so that's, uh, it's interesting that DC even has that. And the fact that the head of it is the white house is, uh, is very extraordinary. And, um, you know, and there are other things like if you were to take, like, if you were to use Google earth and you were to take one point and put it on the, uh, Easter Island and the other point being like, say the Egyptian pyramids, say the great pyramid, and you just make that line go all the way around the world from those two points, you find that it hits about 14 different points within about a one degree, uh, margin, uh, 14 points in which you hit megaliths. And so it's just like, why would that be, you know? So this is interesting that, uh, and, and there might even be more, frankly. I mean, it's just very interesting that there are these lines that are kind of weirdly geometrical to the earth in which these things can, you know, be found. And uh, here's another weird one, right? If you take a line and you, you draw it from DC to New York, uh, and make it continue, it hits Boston. And then if you continue that line going across the Atlantic ocean, the first point that it actually hits across the Atlantic Ocean is Stonehenge. Da, da, da. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things are interesting to me just because those are conversations that you can have with other people. And in some ways, it's kind of like a magic trick unto itself, just by giving me that aha moment of, wow, I never thought about that before. You know, whether or not they want to debunk it or not, it's, it's, fa it's fact. You know, it's something that you can, you can talk about that is uh that is a fact. And that uh, actually does make people go, Hmm, you know, like, uh, like another one that you can put on Snopes would be that, uh, uh, the, uh, latitude of the King's chamber of the Egyptian pyramid of the great pyramid in Egypt actually matches identically to the first I think nine numbers in the speed of light. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and it's something, and, and, you know, there are like lots of skeptical ways of looking at it. Like you can say, well, you know, if it's the latitude number, that means lots of stuff line up with the speed of light. And it's true that, you know, lots of stuff probably does, but the King's chamber of the great but pyramid that does. Right. The fact that that does is kind of interesting, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how walk me through your journey of I'm interested in this occult, arcane, hidden knowledge of mystery and sacred geometry and things that are weird and balancing that with. Was it the Smithsonian that you were performing at recently? Like <laughs> work, working at these highly respectable, highfalutin corporate clients, are they bringing you in to be that, that wacko? Or is it that you've learned how I to bring the curiosity of those topics while presenting a polished front? Like walk me through that artist balance yeah, of probably, curiosity probably and a little and, bit more of the latter. Um, I would say that, uh, so being a mentalist is someone in my opinion, that is, should be interested in the possibilities of the human potential. So, 
So if you're a magician, you can easily say everything that I do is just an illusion and, uh, and, and, and that's okay. Okay. And, and not every magician even does that and that's okay as well. But you know, if, when they can, people step into a theater, they buy a ticket to see that show. And when they're buying a ticket to see that show, they are stepping into that art form. They're stepping into that realm. And, uh, and so, so they're going to immerse themselves in whatever realm it is, whether it's going to be, you know, wh whether it's Xavier Mortimer or whether it's Banachek, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a realm and it's always, and it's going to be a little bit different each, each one that they go into. So when they step into, so, you know, my realm, if I were to put it is I, I try to be, I try to be genuine. I try to be authentic. I try not to sound too scripted. Um, I feel like I feel ultimately, and then also I don't like to take myself too seriously. So, I mean, I, I, the other thing is that. You know, the other day I met a person I said, where are you from? It's from Washington state. I said, have you seen Bigfoot? So, I mean, I'm just interested in, <laughs> I'm interested. I, I like people to think of me as being a person who does have curious understandings of things and, and, and has have knowledge of those things. But at the same time, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take it with a grain of salt and I'm going to, uh, sweeten it up with a few jokes if I can. And so. You know, I, I try very hard to, I think what it is, is I try to engage people and I, and more than anything as a performer, I think that it's really just about engagement. So if they are looking at someone who is just taking them through a whole bunch of boring mathematical process, then there's nothing entertaining about that and, and, and it's not going to be fun for them. Whereas if I give them something interesting to think about and give them some idea, you know, give them some form of inspiration, whether it be about, uh, the existence of Bigfoot or UFOs or the existence of, you know, some kind of sick, weird, sacred geometry, or even the ability to connect with one another through the conscious ether. I feel that, I feel that that's the way to create a fun dialogue between yourself and your audience that, uh, that engages them. And then from my own experience as a performer and, and as a mentalist and as a person who is also interested in methods and techniques and principles and stuff like that, that are designed literally to amaze people in a live, uh, how should I say, um, non digital, uh, way. I feel that, uh, I feel that that is an experience that people can actually appreciate. I think that to this day, People actually do appreciate analog mystery and that's, uh, and that's something that's worth, that's something to worth, that's worth exploring because the impact is high. And so long as you can engage them and take them to that point of, of astonishment or surprise, then boom, you have yourself a fun little presentation. And, uh, and so long as you can just make yourself seem interesting to people and, and, and be lighthearted about it, then that's like, that to me is the beginning of having a great show. Beautiful. And I'll, again, I'll make sure all the, the links and, and such are in the show notes below and would make sure we put a bow on this. Where do you want people to come find you? Well, I'm in Las Vegas. Please uh, find me on the socials. Find me on Instagram. I'm uh, Alan underscore new, um, on Twitter and on Instagram and, uh, and, uh, on YouTube, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm on a little bit of a summer hiatus that, uh, actually had more to do with the fact that my computer broke down, but, uh, but this is the computer that broke down and it seems to be working. So I'm, I'm probably soon going to start that up, uh, while I'm here in Vegas, uh, once again, and, uh, keep up my, uh, keep it going. Beautiful. It's that dry desert air does wonders for electronics. You know, it's one thing that I will say about, about Las Vegas weather that I love is that it is actually so dry. And even though right now you don't want to be here in Vegas, it's like, it's so hot. It's ridiculous. Like it hits you like kicking the nuts every single time you walk into the sun. But, uh, but aside from those two months in Vegas, of which this is one in which it's the worst, um, most of the time it's beautiful. And because of that. I don't have to deal with two things on a regular basis. And one of them is rain and one of them, 
and one of them is ice and uh, and cold and 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 ultra cold weather because those two things will actually keep me from being productive so well and uh and vegas has less of it which makes me a lot more productive when i'm out here oh overall that's a really good insight so dude thank you so much for sitting down with me i i love talking to you every time i get the chance so yeah, dude, me too. Uh, last time in chicago we had lunch that was fun that really was and i i've got itchy feet for vegas so i i gotta get out there sooner rather than later that's for sure yeah come out and visit It'd be great to see you again and there you have it a wonderful conversation with alan and as always there's a lot more behind the scenes of our full conversation that's available to supporters of the show which you can do for a couple bucks a month in order to get started head to symbolsandsecrets.com secret and that will forward you to our members area to small community but very tight knit where i want to share everything that i know about how to help you make a living doing magic and mentalism now i want to kind of turn it back over to alon because he actually has a phenomenal opportunity for anybody interested in learning from a master on how to do metal bending you can learn straight from alon so I wanted to put this at the very end so that the diehard fans who this would be most useful and most valuable to would hear it. So check this out. Speaking of little ideas that unfolds into big things, since you are a mentalism podcast, I will say that um, for those people who are intrigued at my work as a metal bender, um, I have started to open myself up to uh, classes, private classes that uh, teach systems of transforming metal, which is my online course right now. And, um, I, I think I have, uh, I think I have a good way of being able to both, uh, field my students and clients and, uh, and, and, and in order to maintain the secret of what I'm doing, but uh, ultimately my entire knowledge of metal bending gets uploaded into your brain. And, uh, the cost is, uh, is a simple $1,500 for the, uh, for the 20 hour course. And, uh, that breaks down to roughly about $75 an hour. But I mean, really it, it was just my way of saying, you know, what would be the best way for me to, uh, to be able to give people what I know about metal bending and, and truly what I know about metal bending and what I know about that, that particular style of, uh, of mentalism or that, that, that particular style of, of the way we perform is, is something that I've formed into a career. So, uh, you know, not to say that my, my master class is any better than say Banachek's or Kenton Neppers or Osterlin's or, or anybody else who might be teaching metal bending out there, Guy Bavli or whoever. Um, I would say that, uh, I'd say that one thing is for sure. And that is it's different. It's totally different from all of them. And, uh, and, and then I'll say this as well. I think that it's, I, I'm pretty sure that it's more comprehensive than any of their classes in terms of how I, how, how much information gets delivered to you within the 20 hours that, uh, that, uh, you take the class and, and, you know, and in the end it breaks down to roughly about as much as say a hypnosis certification type course. So, so it's, uh, it's. I feel like I've priced it properly. I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's not asking too much, but it's not asking for too little either. And, um, and, uh, I feel that, uh, everybody has been very, very good about keeping the secrets, uh, contained and, and, uh, and, and keeping it for the purpose of astonishing audiences and engaging audiences, which is what its exact purpose is. And so, uh, um, so. That's just to let anybody who is interested in, in exploring uh, that field with me. That's it for this episode of Symbols and Secrets. Thanks for listening.